site has such a mosaic of, of little, um, you know, small areas of habitats in, in different habitats in close proximity, you know, uh, open areas and creek lines with bush, bushy sections and, and beautiful wetlands and, you know, that, that it's possible to, to, for anyone pretty much to walk around close to you know within the townships i mean that's really really important i think uh there's there aren't very many sort of reedy really reedy ponds in in the upper blue mountains and one of the birds that you get here in the summer is the reed warbler the australian reed warbler and it's quite a hard bird to see it's just a small brown colored bird, quite plain looking. It has a very loud and continuous song through spring and summer. Yeah, there's that flock of galahs. Mm -hmm. Oh look, a couple of, see the large water birds here, ibis. Mm -hmm. Two straw-necked ibis mm -hmm. flying. Um, it's just disappearing over there, flock of galahs. So they're different to the ibis you see in Sydney. These are straw-necked ibis with black wings. Here they come, oh, they're putting on a great show mm -hmm. for us. <laughs> so they're often referred to as the farmer's friends because they'll, you'll get big groups of them in a paddock and they'll eat the pests, like they'll eat the locusts and, and things like that. The birds have, have bred up into bigger numbers after the floods. Mm. And now that those floods are, are drying up a little bit, they're dispersing. So we're seeing a lot of movement of various water birds. Um, a, a good example is that there, for the past couple of weeks there's been a yellow-billed spoonbill in oh, the yeah, gully in the, yeah. and, um, and that's not a bird that you normally see there. Mm. So, and you know, here's another example. We, we get them from time to time in the mountains, but not that often. But when the water level is lower and you get some muddy areas exposed on the edge of the reeds, that's a good time to look out for some of those really, really interesting little um, swamp dwelling birds like rails and crakes, which are very hard to see. But if you sit quietly, especially early in the morning, that's when you have a chance to see them or hear them. I can also hear in the distance, I can hear some silver eyes. Now they're part of the honey eater migration, even though they're not actually honey eaters, they move along with the honey eaters. Um, grey fantail, see this oh, yeah. just mm. flitting around in the top of that bush. Now that's one of the birds that come through with the honey eater migration. Again, it's not a honey eater, it's, a, it's, a, it's an insect eating, it's like a fly catching bird, but it's grey grey and white and um, and darts around catching insects in the air. Now here's the grey fantail above us. Somewhere. So this little squeaking noise I'm making is uh, what birders call pishing. Just up there we go. So, so a bird like that, it's quite hard to get your binoculars onto it. But if you just search for the movement with the naked eye, that's the... I'm just sitting here. And if you haven't noticed, when we go back to the meeting point, the poster has a photo of this little fellow on it. So, <laughs> You'll find them in the upper mountains in summer. But in addition to that, at this time of year, um, in early autumn, you just get big numbers of them actually moving through the area. There it goes. <laughs> just constantly moving. It hardly ever sits still. So you'll hear, you'll hear little chip, chip, chip sounds as they fly over. So that's the yellow-faced honey eaters. We actually have the Blue Mountains Bird Observers have um, people out counting through autumn to, to monitor the numbers of migrating honey eaters at different sites, including Narrow Neck. A lot of them come up, come up Narrow Neck. So they're going north at this time of year. So they should be coming this direction. But on a good day, our counters will count. Um, they do 20 minute counts and can count 
maybe up to uh, 6,000 birds in 20 minutes. Um, even even more sometimes, you know, just it's just phenomenal the, the numbers that come through. But then other days there'll be hardly any, so it's very hard to predict. And one of the things we found from our counts is that after the big bushfires, you know, at the end of 2019, um, a lot of the areas that they migrate through were, were very severely burnt and they actually changed their route, their migration route to go around those burnt areas. Like be, be, yeah, exactly. Mm. Because they're, they're, um, they're more vulnerable when they're flying through mm. sort of open areas without, because um, the birds of prey hang around the migration routes. Mm. And so they need somewhere to, you know, to dart into and hide if there's, um, if there's a bird of prey around. The migration really is just like a, watching them move along a highway. And, um, and so it's a good opportunity to monitor their numbers, but it's, you know, the protection needs to be done where they've come from or where they're going to. So who's not familiar with the fairy wrens? Anyone? Okay, that's, do you know what blue wrens are? I don't know what birds are. <laughs> okay, no, no worries. They're tiny birds with a long tail that usually sits up, up straight. Now the, the breeding males are bright blue. Yeah. And, um, but the females and the non-breeding males and the immatures are brown. People used to think, you know, you'd see a group with one blue bird and lots of brown birds and people would think it's a male and he's harem. But in fact, most of those brown birds are either um, immatures or non-breeding males. So they, the males actually molt twice a year. So they go into their breeding plumage and then at the end of summer, they come out of their breeding plumage into their eclipse plumage, which is the brown oh, colour. Oh, interesting. Yeah. oh, it's good. Beautiful day, lovely brunch, and Carol's a fantastic guide. Thank you.